Today, roughly half of all Christians believe that Jesus Christ will return to earth in their lifetime. The book of Revelation contains Jesus Christ's last words to the Christian church about the future. He warns of the terrible events that will fall upon the earth during the tribulation, what will happen to Satan, to the Antichrist, and to all who follow false religion. He tells what will happen at the Battle of Armageddon, his second coming to earth, his millennial kingdom, the final judgment, and describes what God has planned for his people in eternity future. In this series, we will take you chapter by chapter through the book of Revelation to help you understand its message and the future events God predicts are up ahead. My guests are Dr. Ed Heinsen, Dean of Liberty University's School of Religion and Distinguished Professor of Religion and the author of over 40 books. Dr. Mark Hitchcock is Associate Professor of Bible Exposition at Dallas Theological Seminary. He's the author of 30 books on biblical prophecy and is the senior pastor of Faith Bible Church. Dr. Ron Rhodes also teaches at Dallas Theological Seminary and is president of Reasoning from the Scriptures Ministries. He's the author of 70 books on prophecy. Join us for this special edition of The John Ankerberg Show. Welcome to our program. We're talking about what were Jesus' last words to the church, okay? Very important. He had a lot to say about what's happening in the future, what's going to happen in the future. And we've got three of the best that are going to take us through the entire book of Revelation. We've got Dr. Ed Heinsen, who is Dean of the Divinity School at Liberty University. He's also a distinguished professor of religion. Second is Dr. Mark Hitchcock, Associate Professor of Bible Exposition at Dallas Theological Seminary. And Dr. Ron Rhodes is President of Reasoning from the Scripture Ministries. He also teaches at Dallas Theological Seminary and several other seminaries. So uh, I think we have like 140 books these guys have written on prophecy sitting here, and it's a lot of time and study. But guys, I want to get right to our topic at hand, and that is the book of Revelation. And Ed, uh, start us off. Uh, who gave us the information? How did this get written? Tell me the players that are involved right at the very front when you open up the first page. The very first verse of the book says that it's the revelation of Jesus Christ uh, that he gave to his servant John. So we know right from the beginning Jesus is the divine author, John is the human author, and the Lord appears 65 years after the resurrection, appears to John on the island of Patmos and reveals the future to him. Uh, this is Jesus' personal disciple who spent three years with him uh, in his earthly ministry. Uh, the disciple that leaned on Jesus' shoulder at the Last Supper, uh, the only disciple who showed up at the cross. Uh, there's not a disciple with a more personal relationship uh, to Jesus than John, and yet when the glorified risen Christ appears to him, the Bible says in this chapter that John fell on his face as though he were dead. Uh, it reminds us that when you get to heaven one day and you think, I want to see Jesus, uh, it's not going to be a casual thing to just walk up and say, well, hi. If John is on his face, <laughs> worshiping the divine Christ, where do you think you and I will be? <laughs> I, I love that because you just think about that, John seeing Jesus in all of his glory and falling at his feet is dead. But I also love the fact that Jesus came and put his hand on his shoulder and said, don't be afraid, I got a lot to tell you. And Mark, why is it that every Christian needs to read the book of Revelation uh, this is the most exciting information. It's the last words of Jesus to the church. And there's a promise that's right in the scripture. Tell us about why every Christian should read and study the book of Revelation. Well, it's the book that tells us about the future, but there's an added incentive and motivation in the book of Revelation because in the very third verse, it says, Blessed is the one who reads, those who hear, and those who keep the words of this prophecy for the time is near. Uh, this is the only book in the Bible with this kind of a unique promise. And that's why many have called the book of Revelation the blessing book. 
Uh, there's a special blessing attached to those who read, those who hear, and those who heed or who do the things written in this book. So all of those who are uh, joining us uh, for these programs on the book of Revelation, every one of them need to get ready to be blessed okay. during this study. Then if you read scripture, it says, John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler over the kings of the earth. There's a question in there. This comes from the Trinity, God. God is one, but he's three in person, and the fact is, is that uh, lay people get thrown off by the seven spirits who are before the throne. Mm -hmm. Why do we believe that's the Holy Spirit? Well, the statement right before that, he says, from him who was, who is, and who is to come. And then right after that, there's a reference to Jesus. So right in between the statement about God the Father and Jesus, there's the mention of these seven spirits. So whoever the seven spirits are, they have to be a part of, uh, of the, the Trinity. And so the seven spirits, though, doesn't mean they're seven Holy Spirits. Um, probably the number seven is used 54 times in the book of Revelation. It speaks of something that's complete or that's perfect. And so this, this speaks of the, really the perfection or kind of the fullness of the power of the Holy Spirit. And probably is a reference back to uh, Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 and 2, yep. where the sevenfold ministry of the Holy Spirit there is described. And before we go on and talk about what the churches heard, what, what the message was to the churches, seven churches, uh, tell us about the description about Jesus, Ron. This is, uh, uh, this is so important. The why did Jesus come to earth? What are his titles? How did he look in his glorified person? Well, that's an incredible uh, revelation that we find here in uh, chapter 1. We find that Jesus is called the Alpha and the Omega. And these are the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet. What you must understand is that the names used of God are revelatory names. They always tell us something about God. And in the Old Testament, we often find God being called the Alpha and the Omega. For example, Isaiah 44 and 48. But in this verse, we see that Jesus is called the Alpha and the Omega, which means that He is God. He is eternal. He is omnipotent. He is sovereign. And the important thing to understand is that we find those facts worked out throughout the rest of the book of Revelation because Jesus shows that he is the omnipotent sovereign over the entire tribulation period. And I love this fact where it says in the scripture, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. The priesthood of the believers, all of us that are Christians, we are priests that, that God wants to use while we're, while we're here on earth. Well, it's a staggering thing because this is God, eternal God who loved you and me so much that he stepped out of eternity and took on a human nature for the purpose of dying on the cross for you. There's no greater love than that. And so what we have at the very beginning of the book of Revelation is an affirmation of God's overall purpose for saving humanity. Yeah. Mark, let me come to you. When John says Jesus is coming and every eye will see him, mm -hmm. okay? And uh, even those who pierced him and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Why does this tell us that John is talking about the second coming of Christ and not the rapture? Well, the rapture of the church, is when that takes place, Jesus is not actually coming back to the earth. And it simply says there in, in passages like 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 uh, that we're going to be caught up, uh, believers are, those who've died are going to be resurrected and receive their new bodies. Those of us who are alive are going to be caught up. We're going to, to meet the Lord in the air. Uh, the rapture is going to happen according to 1 Corinthians 15 in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Whereas this says here that every eye on the earth is going to see him. So these are two different events where only believers are going to be caught up to be with Jesus Christ at the rapture. It's going to be an event that the world's not going to see. It's going to happen in the time it takes to blink your eye. The second coming of Jesus is going to be visible to everyone all over the face of the earth. So that's one of the reasons we believe there's a, a time between the rapture and the return of Jesus to the earth. You know, we might also point out that the rapture is imminent. It could take place at any moment. There's no prophecy that has to be fulfilled before the rapture. 
but the second coming has seven years worth of signs that precede it. <laughs> and those signs are recorded for us in the book of Revelation. Which we're going to get to. Mark, very important question. Why was John on the island of Patmos and when was he there? Well, John was banished by the Emperor Domitian, the Roman Emperor Domitian, uh, to the island of Patmos to, to get him away from the churches, the influence he was having there. And he was banished there in the mid-90s. Uh, we know that really from church history. Um, people in the second century like Irenaeus, who really just lived uh, about uh, 80 years after John died, 50 to 60 years after John died. Uh, Irenaeus tells us that John was banished there uh, by the Roman Emperor Domitian. He was banished there for preaching the gospel. Of Jesus Christ. So, like uh, Peter and like Paul, he was persecuted by the Roman Empire where they were both martyred. John was simply banished to the island. It tells us he was there for the Word of God and because of his testimony that he was giving to and Jesus. And how many of the church fathers actually recorded this, this, what you're saying? Oh, many of them, yes, dozens of them. Talk about that John is banished there to the island of Patmos during the reign of this emperor Domitian. Domitian reigned from A.D. 81 to A.D. 96. It was near the end of his reign. So usually we just kind of settle for the date of about A.D. 95 is when John was there and when he wrote the book of Revelation. The significance of that, John, is that uh, if that was when it took place, uh, then this is written after the destruction of Jerusalem, uh, this is not written during the time of Nero, as some have tried to suggest. Uh, it's written at the end of the first century. Uh, John is the last living disciple left on the planet, and Jesus is going to reveal to him what's going to happen in the future. Ed, what did uh, Jesus say to John that he was the purpose of his writing? What did he say? That he, what, what was the reason he wanted him to write the book of Revelation? Well, he wanted him to talk about the things which had been, which are, and which will be hereafter. What are those three? Those three categories, the past, the present, and the future, in essence. Uh, he wants to say, I am the Lord of history. Uh, I am the Lord of the church in the present. I'm the Lord of the future. And it's one of the triplets in the book. The book is filled with triplets. Uh, the very blessing passage uh, has three emphases to it. Uh, the person of God, the one who was and is and shall always be. Uh, all those triplets and 1,200 ands are used in the book of Revelation. The little Greek word chi, uh, the chiameter pattern that connects the book together to say this is not a cyclical prophecy going around in circles. It's moving from one event to another to another to another. This happened and then this and then this. It creates anticipation as you read the book. Something exciting is coming in the future and it's Jesus. Yeah, Ron, in the very first chapter when lay people get together and study this and it talks about who God is, they ought to stop and they ought to kind of think about what is being said about God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit because you see the sovereign God ruling over all. It should encourage them in their faith. What else would it would do? Well, I think it would give us confidence in what the future holds. One of the reasons why the book of Revelation was written was to help the persecuted believers in the seven churches. And knowing the last chapter of the book and how we win, as my old friend Dr. Martin put it, gives us strength to deal with the present. Yeah. All right. Now, Jesus said to John, I want you to write to the seven churches. And who were the seven churches? And why did Jesus want to do that? And we're going to talk about that when we come right back, so stick with us. If you would like to have all of the information in our new series, The Last Words of Jesus, the Book of Revelation, all nine television programs are available on DVD for a gift of $110. This series also comes with our 168-page study guide, and you may order this series now by calling us at 1-800-805-3030. All right, we're back. We're talking with Dr. Ed Heinsohn. We're talking with Dr. Mark Kitchcock and Dr. Ron Rhodes. And we're talking about why did God give us the book of Revelation? And we're in the first chapter and Jesus appears to John on the island of Patmos and uh, actually gives them information. And the first thing he says is, I want you to give some information to seven churches. And Ed, take it from there. Who were the seven churches? These are seven literal churches that all existed in Asia Minor that were connected by the same Roman highway. Uh, real churches that all existed in the first century. And Jesus appears in the candlesticks 
representing the churches as Lord of the church, speaking to the churches with authority, and he gives them words of commendation for what they've done right, keep it up, and words of condemnation for what they're doing wrong, they need to repent or change or correct. Uh, the seven churches, Ephesus, probably the mother church, the largest city in Asia Minor, uh, the church that had been ministered to by Paul uh, and uh, by John and by Timothy. And no church had a greater history of ministry than the church at Ephesus. And yet he said to them, after all these years of their existence, uh, you have left your first love. You're preoccupied with other good things, but you've left your first love, which is the Lord himself. Then he goes up the road to the next church, Smyrna, a persecuted church, uh, be faithful if necessary even unto death, uh, and then to Pergamos, uh, a very political church. It was in the center where the Roman army was headquartered in Asia Minor, uh, where the Christians would be tempted to compromise with the government, uh, and then around to Thyatira, a very prosperous church, uh, the smallest of the seven cities, and yet the longest letter because they had the most theological problems. Prosperity had taken them away from uh, their commitment to Christ. Uh, and then to Sardis, a powerless church, you're nearly dead, wake up, your candle is about to flicker and go out. Uh, and then uh, to Philadelphia, a persevering church, you have a little bit of strength. I've set before you an open door, and because you persevered, uh, I'm going to give you this open door of opportunity uh, to reach the world. And the last one, uh, Laodicea, uh, you're neither hot nor cold, you're lukewarm, the putrid church, uh, if you don't change. I had to spit you out of my mouth, uh, and in the end, he stands knocking on the door of that church, uh, saying, don't lock the Lord of the church outside of the church. You know, John, one of the things that strikes me is uh, that while each letter is written to an individual church with their particular needs, at the same time, each letter ends by saying, let him who has an ear hear what the Spirit says to all the churches. The principles that deal with these churches really apply to all churches at all times. Ryan, the fact is, is a lot of lay people, they look at the symbolism in the book of Revelation, they say, I don't know what the symbolism is. And here, when it talks about the seven stars and the seven lampstands and, and what they are, you don't have to guess at what they are. If you read just a few verses later in Revelation 1.20, the fact is the Bible tells you what the symbols are. Talk about that. Well, that's right. And this is one reason why the book of Revelation should not scare you away. The Bible tells you what the symbol is, and then it tells you what it means. So, for example, the golden lampstands, you might read that and say, well, what are the golden lampstands? But if you read just a little bit further, you find out that it's the seven churches. Then you read about seven stars. A little bit later, we're told that it's seven angels over the churches. Or we might read about incense. And then we're told that incense represents the prayers of God's people. And so many of the symbols that are used in the book of Revelation are defined for us right in the immediate context, which of course makes it much easier to understand. Yeah. Mark, the fact is you're a pastor. What I find interesting about what Jesus says is that he says, I'm standing right in the midst mm -hmm. of every one of these churches. He sees everything that's going on. He knows what's in their heart and how they serve him. And boy, that's a scary thought when you think about any church, when you think about your church, whatever's going on there, he's right in the midst, he sees the whole thing. I love when we go back to Ephesus, okay, and let's go back to a couple of these things. Think about this church, the pastor of this church. He says, I know, Jesus says, your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear the, those who are evil, and you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and they have found them liars, and you have persevered and have had patience, and you've labored for my name's sake, and have not become weary. Now, boy, I'll tell you what, that's a super-duper church right there. No, that's right. It's, it's a, it's a five-star church. I mean, this is like the flagship church in, in the New Testament. And yet he says, nevertheless, mm -hmm. I have this against you, you have left your first love. Now, they didn't lose it. They deliberately turned away from it. They left it. What is that first love? Well, I think the first love there is their love for Jesus Christ. Uh, you know, they'd come to Jesus Christ and believed in Him, trusted in Him, the one who died on the cross for their sins. And, but over time, um, you know, it, it's interesting. Uh, you know, even our, our love for Jesus Christ can diminish, even though these people were busy. They were busy working for the Lord. Uh, they had all their theology correct. You know, someone uh, said once that, you know, you can be as straight as a gun barrel theologically, but you can be as cold as a gun barrel spiritually. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, that's really how they were. That they had all the right doctrine. Uh, they knew the right things. Uh, but they had fallen away in their love and their passion for Jesus Christ. And that's a great warning really for all of us today, that we not allow other things to come in and replace our love uh, for Jesus Christ. Now, Ryan, it says in here about the Ephesus church and all of these churches, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to him who overcomes. And then there's rewards that are given. What is an overcomer? Is this a special class of Christians or is this everybody? I think a lot of people wonder whether it is a special class of Christians. And they often wonder if they're on the brink of losing their salvation because they're wondering if they're good enough to be an overcomer. But if you're going to come across a word like overcomer in the Bible, doesn't it make sense to let the Bible define for us what is meant by that word? If we go to 1 John 5, verses 4 and 5, we read, For everyone who is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. So what that means is that all of us are overcomers. And when you think about it, John, when you look at all the different rewards that are given to people in the seven churches, those things can be said to be true of all Christians. For example, there's the statement that... Uh, you know, one church is not going to experience the second death. Well, no Christian will experience the second death, which is an eternal death. And so, like I said, an overcomer is one who has been born of God, and that means all Christians. Yeah, Ed, I want to talk to you about Smyrna here. The fact is, he says, you're going to suffer persecution. Uh, indeed, he says, the devil's going to throw some of you right into prison that you may be tested. Okay? You know, the health, wealth, and prosperity doctrine seems to go down the drain when you get these little statements. And you will have tribulation 10 days. And then, you know, be faithful. Some of you are going to die. Okay? And even this has gone down through the centuries. And you said, what, in this last year or in this last period of time, how many people have died in that area? Well, and what was amazing in Smyrna was John's own personal disciple, Polycarp, uh, a generation later, would be burned at the stake for his faith in Christ and would refuse to recant. Uh, even as uh, late as uh, the early 20th century, 20,000 Christians uh, were martyred in the city of Smyrna, uh, modern day Izmir. Uh, Christians are facing persecution today all over the planet. Uh, and we need to remember, especially those of us in America, uh, the plight of the persecuted church and the fact that there are believers all over the world who are standing up for their faith in Christ and will not give in. Uh, Jesus said, whoever affirms me before men, I will affirm or confess before my Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will deny before my Father in heaven. A real believer knows if Jesus is worth living for, he's worth dying for. Okay. Mark, you are a pastor of quite a large church. And as you listen to this, what strikes you? Talk to the people that are in churches all over the world that are listening to us talk, and maybe they realize some of the things that Jesus condemned in these churches applies to them. What should they do? How, as a pastor yourself, what would you tell them? Well, you know, when you read the letters to the seven churches, over and over again, Jesus says, I know your deeds. I know your deeds. So the first thing we need to recognize is Jesus knows what's happening in our churches. Um, he's the Lord that, that, that's in the middle of these candlesticks. He, he's in the middle of He knows what's happening. To one of the churches at Pergamum, he says, I know where you dwell. I know where you live. So Jesus knows where we live. He, he knows what we're doing. And so we can't fool him. We need to understand that to begin with. We need to read these letters to these churches and the things that the Lord commends and that he says are the good things they were doing. We need to emulate those and follow those as an example. But there's strong condemnation in the letters to these seven churches. And we need to take those seriously in our churches today. And if those things were true in the early church, how much more are many of those things true in our churches today? Yeah. And we need to be serious about that. And we need to come to the Lord. He calls uh, several of these churches to repent, uh, to turn uh, from those things that they're doing. So we need to take that seriously as pastors, as leaders, to make sure that our lives are right with the Lord. Yeah, this is the God of the universe that is talking and saying, there's certain things that I know that I like, but there are certain things that are absolutely wrong and can bring judgment, okay? So next week, we're going to continue looking at these churches, and then we're going to move on into what Jesus tells John is going to happen in the future, all right? So you don't want to miss this. Join us next week.
If you would like to have all of the information in our new series, The Last Words of Jesus, the Book of Revelation, our nine television programs are available on three DVDs. Our first DVD covers Revelation 1 through 6 and is titled, The Glorified Jesus Reveals the Future. Our guests describe Jesus' appearance to John and his commission to him to write the book of Revelation. John then writes letters to the seven churches and is taken up to the throne room of God where he sees Jesus open seven seals that rain down different judgments on earth. Our second DVD contains three more programs that cover chapters 7 through 13, which we have titled, The Judgments and Main Players of the Tribulation. Here, we learn about the seven trumpet judgments. As a result of the seal and trumpet judgments, half of the world's population will die. We'll then discover the main players in the tribulation, including a woman, a child, and a dragon who symbolize Israel, Jesus, and Satan. We are told about the Antichrist, the false prophet, the mark of the beast, and 144,000 Jewish evangelists. Our third DVD is entitled, Armageddon, the Second Coming and Eternity Future, and covers Revelation chapters 14 through 22. Here we learn about the seven horrible bowl judgments and the battle of Armageddon, Jesus will defeat his enemies at his second coming and set up his millennial kingdom on earth. This will be followed by God's final judgment and a description of the new heaven and earth for believers. Today, you may order our entire series on Revelation containing all nine television programs for $110. With this series, we are going to include our 168-page book of Revelation study guide. This new study guide includes extensive notes that parallel our television programs with nine sessions for your personal study or Bible study group. If you'd like to have five or more study guides, they are available for $8 each. Finally, I taped a one-hour question and answer session with our scholars discussing the rapture, the identity of the Antichrist, the mark of the beast, the coming global government, and much, much more. You may obtain this DVD for a gift of $20. And if you'd like to have all of these materials together, including all nine DVD programs, our new 168-page study guide, plus the one-hour question and answer session, they are available together in a special package for only $125. You may order the special package now by calling us at one 800 805-3030. That's 1-800-805-3030. We may also order these materials at jashow.org.